We're going to start a study today where we're kind of looking at uh, some of the aspects of salvation uh, that are very important. You know, there's a lot of voices out there to tell us stuff, and it was interesting to me uh, because basically I listened to a lot of sports stuff, and so I was um, noting a couple things that came up in the last week or so that had a lot of spiritual implications to them, and it was interesting and fun. I wanted to say fun, but I'm not sure if that's a good word. Um, as some of the sports analysts uh, gave their commentary to what was going on. For instance, you probably know a little over a week ago in the state of Iowa was their state um, wrestling tournament. And there was a young boy who was um, pretty highly tout touted as a wrestler who, who forfeited a, a match because of his own religious belief. Um, what he did was he was up against a girl and he did not feel that that was proper for a boy to do that. And I thought that was pretty honoring. I thought it was really good. Since then, you heard all kinds of sports commentaries. And the other day I heard uh, a big name sports commentator for ESPN and Sports Illustrated say that this kid claims that he respects females, so he could not do this, but in reality, he's disrespecting her because he doesn't treat her as an equal in competition. And it's like, okay, they missed the boat. That's the point I'm trying to make. So often they miss the boat uh, spiritually, and, but yet they will tell us, and obviously a, a Rick Riley or somebody like that has a much wider audience than I do, so I can tell you what I think from God's word, but he's telling millions of people what he thinks outside of God's word and has a little bit of a bigger impact. What about BYU in the last week? Um, they had a basketball player, uh, and you go to BYU, uh, which is not a Christian school. It's a Mormon school that's not a Christian school, but they have some principles the same as what we would hold to and as far as morality and stuff. And you sign a pledge. If you go to a Christian school, you'll sign a pledge that you're going to obey rules and follow their standards and, and represent the school well. And it became known, and I'm not sure how that happened, that um, a young lady on campus that he had been seeing is now pregnant by him. So he was dismissed from the basketball team. Their basketball team is a pretty good team. They're a good top-level team. They're probably a top 20 team in the nation, and a big March Madness multi-billion dollar tournament is coming up next week with the selection committee. And here they go cutting one of their better players, not the best player, but one of the key components, and they kicked them off the team and dismissed them from school. And now you're getting all the sports pundits who are telling you how narrow-minded that is, how they have no right, even though the kid signed a pledge saying he would not do certain things, which he ended up doing, it still falls on the school as being wrong. So you have all these people telling us what the Christian or the spiritual or the moral position should be. And, um, and then what about the other day when, uh, and this was really, really tragic, when 16-year-old um, uh, Wes Leonard made that uh, final basket layup in overtime in Michigan to give his team a 20-0 record. And while they were celebrating, he collapsed, had a heart attack, and died. And uh, I mean, that's just unthinkable and unbelievable. And when you see that, and I looked at that quite a bit, uh, and some of the things surrounding that, and even the colors and everything of their school and their student body, it's like, that's Rittman. It just happens to be in Michigan, that's all. And I mean, it just could easily have been one of our schools, and then to hear the people talk and some of the things they say and uh, about you know, the outcome of that. There's a lot of voices that would like to tell us how we should look at life, how we should view disasters, how we should view good things in life and bad things in life, and, uh, and that's okay because uh, everyone has an opinion, everyone has their take on God, on who he is and what he does, and how he operates. Um, there's lots and lots of opinions. So who's right? Of all those I've listened to, I would probably say none of them. <laughs> probably in most cases, none of them are right. 
Uh, not that I have the corner in truth, and that's not what I'm going to purport here. But I would say the only way to know God is to hear him, to listen to him, and to look at his word and see what exactly he is telling us. So in getting in with God, which is really important because when 16-year-old kids pass away uh, in an athletic event, by the way, that same school last year had a kid go home from a wrestling meet and died at home later that day. So, I mean, they're really, um, they're really getting hit with it. And when those things happen, uh, and I spent a couple days this last week at our school because we had a suicide recently, a week ago, and, and so I, I know what questions are being asked by kids and by faculty. And, and when that, those things happen, people all of a sudden, whether it's legal or not, start thinking about spiritual truths and what are they. Uh, and I want to tell you, I heard and hear a lot of amazing and wonderful things. Uh, and, and everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a right to an opinion. My point is just simply m your opinion, my opinion are useless and baseless unless it's founded on something right and true and clear and accurate. And the only thing that qualifies there is God's word. So how you get in with God um, is an important question because people do pass away. They do die and, and there is an eternity. Something's going to happen afterwards and we want to know what it is. And I would suggest that God's way is the only uh, answer to that. Um, so the big personal question is, how do you get saved? You know, if we're all going to, sooner or later, we're all going to clock out of this world. And so, uh, you know, what are we going to do? How do we know that, that uh, we're going to, how did this ha happen? And again, there's lots of opinions. I've heard um, people say that God accepts everyone. Oh, I'm sure, you know, a loving God would surely never turn away people. Then when you say to them, well, what about Adolf Hitler, you know, or somebody like that? Well, surely, yeah, yeah, that's fine. God can send Hitler to hell. That's okay. Um, but then I, I finally conclude that you want to be the one who sets the standard of who makes it and who doesn't. And, and you may have a little formula that helps that, but I'm not so sure that you, whoever you are, are the authority that God bases it on. I, I don't think so. Or there's some groups um, that will say, but we make it. Our church is the right church, and so we make it. Um, and not to pick on anybody, but we have a, a friend connected to our church that our young adult Sunday school class supports um, quite, quite well, uh, Joe Kine. He's been here a couple times. He has a ministry to Amish people. And some of you I know have gotten the emails that he sent out a couple weeks ago, one of the, uh, a girl that left the Amish and came and lived with them, has been with them at their home for about six months, and they've been trying to reach her, try to help her understand life and God and Christ and things like that. And uh, ultimately, she got in an accident, and it's a very, very bad accident. She's in a coma. And Joe is there day and night. Uh, he and Esther, his wife, are there ministering to the families. Amish from two different states, outside of states, have come to be there and, and do a little visual with them. And, and they're, they're just trying to help, and Joe's trying to reach these people. And ultimately, Joe shared um, the truth from Scripture as to what it takes to, to, have, to be in with God, a relationship with God. And the Amish people have kicked him out. They don't want him there. And the answer that the gentleman gave was we respect you, we, we appreciate all you've done and, and what you're doing, but we were raised that our church is the only church that's going to go to heaven, so we cannot accept any of the things you're saying. So if you tell us anything different, you need to leave. That's dangerous because I think scriptures say that it's really a relationship. It's not a church. It's not an opinion. It's not anything uh, other than a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not feelings. I hear a lot of flaky feelings of people. And one of the things, some of you have heard me say this before, and I'll try to do this in a neutral sense so it doesn't, uh, doesn't offend anybody, but when you see an athlete um, hit a home run, and it's almost baseball season, so weather will get better. He hits a home run, and he's rounding third, and he's coming to home, and he touches that home plate, and he points up in the air, and it's, Grandma, that's for you. 
and, and he'll tell grandma that that's for him and for her, and, and he'll tell everybody that grandma's up there looking down on me. And my question is, and I don't mean to be overly crude, is if grandma's watching you hit home runs, she's probably watching you take a shower, too. Um, so, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, no, 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 I don't want that. Well, then, okay, you figure it out, you know. We're, how does this work? I think uh, we need to read the Bible, and you can read the Bible from cover to cover, and you will never find anywhere where God is asking you to feel anything. He doesn't. He doesn't ask you to feel anything. He does ask you to have faith in things. Feelings are so dubious. They, they just can mess around with us, and we don't have control over those. We need to think about what God tells us uh, in his word, and so we need to examine the Bible, not opinions, not feelings, not even good logic. That's not what it's all about. It's about what God says in his word. There was a conversation once um, between um, Peter and, and a jailer. And Peter was in jail, and things happened, and it was remarkable. Uh, that's a long, long story. I'm not going to go into it. But the jailer says to Peter, what must I do to be saved? That's the big question in life. That really is the biggest, most important question that anybody can ever address. It doesn't matter who's going to win the World Series, this year, although it'll be the Phillies, but it doesn't matter. And, and it doesn't matter, you know, what the weather will be tomorrow, uh, although I do care about that. But the most important thing is what does it take to be saved? What, what do we do? And, uh, and Peter gave this answer. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Now, that's not the entire verse. It, it adds on about in your household as well. And there's reasons to say that. I, I, my explanation would simply be because of the great change in your life that Jesus Christ brings, others are going to be impacted by it. But believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And that is so simplistic that many, many people struggle with that. A long time ago, there was a gentleman that uh, was a serial rapist and murderer. And while he was waiting for his uh, capital punishment execution, many Christian people went to minister to him and reportedly, and I'm not God in either of you, so we can't say, but it, it sounds like from his words and, and what he says, and, and I know those are only words, but it sounds like he might have repented, got saved, and, and maybe you know fits the bill of believing on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, but I, I remember when that was becoming public, a number of Christians, some in this membership of this body, that were furious about that because of all the things that he did, he doesn't deserve that. And I was, I, I'm pretty sure Jesus is going to say to me someday, well, either to you. <laughs> you don't deserve it either. And it's like, you're right. I, I don't deserve uh, the gift of God and the salvation that, that he comes the Apostle Paul addresses the same issue about what do we do to be saved, and I know that's crowded up there, but he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So, you know, Jesus is Lord. He is God, and God raised him from the dead. When he went to the cross and then was placed in the grave, that it is true, three days later, he stepped out of that tomb with great victory, and overcame sin and death. If you believe all that, if that's your faith statement, then you're saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is a heart issue. It's not a feeling issue. It's not um, other people's opinions. It's, it's a heart between you and God. And it's with your mouth that you confess uh, and you are saved. And then a little bit later in that same Romans chapter 10, uh, he goes on to say, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what it takes to be saved. That's what it takes to get in with God. Uh, he's more than uh, willing to accept you. It's just all by faith. It's easy. We sin, you sin, I sin, all of us sin. Everybody, there's no one exempt from that. Jesus died to pay for that sin. He was the accepted sacrifice that God took. God looked down and said, Bud, I don't care what you do. You can't, you can't impress me. You can't overcome the fact that I'm holy and you're sinful. You can't do it. 
But Jesus said, raised his hand and said, well, you know what? I'll go and pay that price. And God the Father is like, whoa, you are the eternal son of God. You are pure and sinless. You are the perfect sacrifice for sin and for eternity. I'll accept that. If you're willing to do that for Bud, I'll take that. And he said, I'll go. I'll go. And he went to the cross, and he died, and then he rose again. <clears throat> There's three factors that I wanted to bring up about uh, this whole idea of getting in with God and, and helping us. We're going to talk about this the next couple weeks, so come back. Make sure you're back again. But... Um, there's a couple things that I want to differentiate. So uh, one of them is the difference between possessors and professors. Uh, and I don't mean schools and colleges and stuff. Um, here we're talking about just that whole thing of faith. There's no place in the Bible where God says, I'm going to promise you all this stuff outside of Jesus and Messiah. You know, if you do this and that, and, and you look really good, you do the religious duty thing, I don't care what you do with my son Jesus, if you do the religious duty thing, you're in, you're good. Doesn't say that anywhere in scripture. Now there are things that'll tell us that we should do as a result of knowing Christ and having faith in God, but there's no such thing as, well, I raised my hand at a service once. And, and I was good, or I walked an aisle. I remember when um, Stephanie Glanko Craig, um, many, many years ago, this was 100 years ago, we sent her to Chicago to an inner city mission, and she served there for about a year or so. And I went there and visited the mission, and the director of the mission was telling me that one of their greatest obstacles spiritually with the kids in the inner city of Chicago was that back then there was this church that would bus kids from inner city Chicago out to their church, actually in Indiana, uh, across the border. They would put um, McDonald's coupons on the seats of the bus and stuff, so kids were getting incentives to come to church. But they would take them there, and the kid would go, and they'd do this big, you know, walk the aisle kind of thing. We sang all 19 verses of Just As I Am Until You Came Forward. And the kid would come forward, and they immediately put him in the baptistry and, they, and send the kid back to inner city Chicago. And the kid's selling drugs. He's murdering people. He's living immorally. And when they would go to witness to him, he said, well, I already did that. I'm saved. I walked an aisle at Jack Kyle's church, and I'm good to go. Don't need to, don't need to do that stuff. But you're living this immoral life. Ah, it doesn't matter. I walked an aisle. It does matter. That doesn't do a thing for you. There's no place in Scripture where it tells you to raise a hand, walk an aisle, or even go to church to be saved. Um, it doesn't matter. You can say, well, I pray. Well, do you, do you know God? Do you pray to him or do you pray to, to the air? Baptism, sacrificial acts, giving, none of that stuff. Although we'll take giving, but, uh, but none of that stuff. None of that stuff gets you in with God. Um, it's our, our salvation is directly related to our faith in Christ. That's what it is all about, and that's what we need to do. So do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Do you believe that this is the only payment for your sin? Or are you saying, no, 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 I can, you know, I, I help little old people like Pastor Bud across the street once in a while, or I buy Girl Scout cookies, or whatever it is you do. Is that what you're banking on? Do you acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ? John wrote this, and this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. God has given us eternal life. I'm, I'm testifying, John says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, that's Jesus. He who has the Son, Jesus, has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. By the way, we'll look at this verse, the next verse later on in the series. Uh, verse 13 goes on to say, and that's the whole reason why I'm writing 1 John. The Apostle John said, this little five-chapter letter I'm writing simply because that you can know that you have Jesus Christ as your Savior and that you have eternal life. That's the whole point of why he's writing this. Um, <coughs> We're talking about eternal life. It's simple as that. You have him or you don't have him. 
There's many people who profess Jesus, but they don't possess Jesus. And there is a difference. Uh, and I hear, hear it every once in a while. Um, here's what Paul wrote in Titus. But when the kindness and love of, our, of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Okay, you got that? He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done. See, it didn't matter what I did. I went to church every Sunday, gave offering, I sang in the choir, I taught a little kid. I even taught junior high kids. I mean, how much more of a sacrifice can you make than that? And, uh, you know, I did all these wonderful things, God. But he said, it says, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that Bud or anybody else has done. Why? Why would he do it? Because of his mercy. Because of his mercy. And then it says that he saved us through, here's how he did it, through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then it goes on to tell you several of those different things. It's God's program. It's his plan. He does it for us. It's an act of God. Even your faith is an act of God. He saved us. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. Well, what's not from it? Well, the grace is not from yourselves because it's God's grace, and he's the one who sent his son and, and did all that stuff. It's God's grace. But I would say also the faith is not of yourselves. And you say, well, I had, to, I had to make a decision, and I had to do this and that. Yeah, that's true, but even that was somehow enabled and, and initiated and inspired by God because it's a gift. It's a gift from God. And we all know what gifts are. Somebody gives somebody else something unconditionally, no strings attached. If somebody were to give you a box of chocolate and then say, and you get all excited, oh, this is wonderful, I'm so thrilled for it. And then they say, yeah, but you owe me a dollar. You know, it's not a gift. It's not a gift. You owe me nothing. It's a gift. And that's what God's done for us. Another uh, factor is eternal versus temporal. Um, and here, and this is what we'll expand on the next couple of weeks, security versus carnality. Uh, carnality is a very weird word, isn't it? Uh, it? Basically, we're talking about walking by the Spirit or walking in the flesh. And in your, uh, in your bulletin, I gave you several different uh, passages of scriptures that you can read through um, later on. But carnality means, it's basically assuming that the person is an immature believer or follower of Christ. It's somebody who's new uh, in, the, in the scripture, and especially in 1 Corinthians 3, it, it uses terms, it equates them to like spiritual babies that they just, they don't know. They don't know. And they're still living in the flesh. They're still kind of fighting with the world and doing things they shouldn't be doing. But, um, and, and in some ways, they can come under God's discipline. Some of his discipline is very loving and protective. And some of his discipline, he lets us out there. And he lets us take a beating because we need to do that in order to, to come back to him and be strong and um, he's saying to these uh, carnal children, you're all worldly. You're like babies. That's what Paul's saying. But he, uh, in Galatians 5, it challenges us to live according to the Spirit. Let God's Spirit lead us. And in Hebrews chapter 12, and that's one you want to read a little bit later, it's, it tells us about God's discipline is actually really good for us. And, and it equates God to sort of like a very loving father who will discipline a child. Uh, most moms and dads, if they love their kids, don't let their kids repeatedly run out into the street because there's consequences of that that are far worse than the spanking they might get. And so God will do that for us. He doesn't let us run out into the spiritual boulevard and, and get run over by the world. Sometimes he will discipline us with a little bit of a spanking, but it's something that's for our good so we come back to, to him and and can, um, can live for him. <clears throat> the purpose is always, always to restore. That's what he wants us to do. Some people will tell you that if you become unspiritual, you get away from the Lord, that, um, that you're lost and, and you can't get back and, and there's no way of knowing. 
And, and God alone knows the heart. And again, we're going to talk about that a lot more next week. But I, I would suggest that's a horrible way to live. I've, I've had several people that I've met that I'd be talking to, and there's people who, who believe in Christ, they're spiritual, um, but they would say basically, but I have no idea. It won't be until the minute I die that I know whether or not God's going to accept me. And I see that more of a, a works-based salvation. It's like if Christ did it, he did it. But we'll talk more about that next week. And, uh, but those are important issues. A third one is to focus. We can focus on what God has done, or we can focus on what we do. And again, salvation is not earned, it's a gift. In Ephesians, we looked at Ephesians uh, 2.8, but if you read through Ephesians chapter 2, those beginning verses, uh, verses 1 through 6-7, talk about how we're dead in our sins and, and how far away from God we really are. So many of the people, if, if you know somebody who does not know Jesus as Savior, and you know lots of people like that, they're literally walking corpse. They're dead. They're dead spiritually. They're dead in their sins. They may be walking around and, and talking and, and acting like real human beings, but they are dead in the eyes of God and outside of, of Christ. Um, Romans chapter 5, which is a wonderful, wonderful verse, verse 8, where it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Here's how God shows that he loves us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So often, something big will happen in the world, a tsunami, an earthquake, some disaster happens, and invariably, somebody's going to say, well, where was God? God is not a loving God that he lets those th things happen. How do you know whether God is a loving God? I think this verse says it all. How does God show that he loves us? He shows that while you were a sinner, he's holy, you're a sinner, he, he shouldn't even look at you. He should cast you into the darkest hell that there ever was and, and get rid of you out of his sight, but he didn't do that. While you were like that, that opposed to him, you were in sin, his son Jesus died for you. That is an amazing thing. Most of us who have children grieve greatly when they suffer at all. Oh no, they fell and skinned their knees. I can't bear it. But to send your son to die for everybody and to bear on him, somebody so perfect and pure to take all the sin of the world upon him, that's just unimaginable for you and I. That is an amazing story. Someone needed help, and the only way would be if somebody died and Jesus stepped forward and volunteered to do that. Voluntarily. And he didn't do it just for some good, nice person. He did it for you and I, who are full of sin. I think God gives us assurance of our relationship with him. But he does it in his own way, and he does it in his own time. It comes from knowing God, knowing his word, spending time with him. But God's promises are definitely sure. They're true. We use this verse a lot, but it's just familiar, and, and people connect with it. But God has said... Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And I know the context of that, and I know the fact that we use that for uh, people who are going through tough things. It's really talking about everyday life. It talks about the marriage relationship in the first couple of verses. It talks about contentedness. It talks just about living every day. So whether you're doing good things or tough things, God says, I'm there, and I'm not going to leave you. The good news and bad news on that is... Uh, the bad news is even when you're doing bad stuff, when you're sinning, when things are not good, God's there. And he's not leaving you, and he's not forsaking you, and he knows what's going on. Uh, but when good things are happening or when you need him so desperately, you're going to face surgery or, or something big is happening. And, uh, but God's there for that as well. So um, he is always there. The question is, who are you going to believe? A lot of opinions, a lot of voices out there. Who are you going to believe so that you know that you are in with God? And I would say God and his word. 
is the way to turn. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your goodness to us. You have paid a price that we would never, ever be able to pay. God, I thank you for the people here today, and, and I just ask that you would just uh, extend your grace to them. May your spirit speak to our spirit. And if anyone's here outside of Jesus Christ, may this be a day that really opens their eyes and sees your truth, because it's your world. You did it. You designed it. You can do it any way you want, but you chose to be merciful and gracious to all of us who are so undeserving of that. But you showed your love. You demonstrated your love and died for us. And I pray that that would be the hope, the message of life for each one here, Lord. Just speak to each one. And Lord, as we live throughout this week, may we be strengthened by you and live to your glory. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.